Amen, amen. He is mighty to save. You may have a seat. Praise the Lord. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Stephen, did I turn this? There you go. I don't know if it's on or not. All right. Good to have you here with us this morning. I tell you what, I appreciate all your prayers. I, I went on a motorcycle trip for most of you that know that, because I mentioned it last week. Left Monday morning, uh, rode all the way up to New York and all the way back on this thing called Mid-Atlanta Back Road Discovery Route, which is 80% dirt, and um, we had a blast. It was absolutely perfect weather. When we got into the north end, uh, the leaves had already changed, some had fallen, some of the most beautiful colors. Fall is one of the beautiful times of the year, especially up here. It is so amazing in the mountains. Every time you come around a curve, it was something different. And because we were riding all day long, we got to see the sun in different sets, uh, different directions. And the way it illuminated the leaves, so, so beautiful. So I appreciate your prayers. We had safety, no malfunctions, no problems. Uh, and we covered a lot of territory, uh, about 750 miles. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, so today, visual aid is going to be a little complicated. I will give you a hint. You saw it once before, back when Pastor Adam was here. He actually built this, and he left it for me. So it may take you a little bit of time to figure out what it is. And I know most of you thought this was just the table up here, but it's not. It is the actual item. So um, are you ready? Can you see that, Chad? Here we go. Anybody have any idea what this is? Now, let me give you a hint. If it was real, I am not strong enough to have picked it up. That's a little hint. All right. Oh, there are some smart people. In. I told you we have some of the smartest people chain burn surrounding the area. That's right. It is a millstone. Now, a millstone is one of those things you'd use and you'd see people lately laying down there rubbing around and separate difference. Hey, this is made out of rock. If it's made out of real rock, this is what we would consider a very small one. I would not be able to pick it. They have some that are really huge. So I want you to picture a huge rock that weighs a lot. I'm talking maybe a thousand pounds. No one person is going to pick it up. Okay, keep that in mind. We'll go somewhere with that today. If you've been with us, what book of Bible are we in? We're in the book of Revelation and we're covering through the beginning to the end. And uh, who is the author of the book of Revelation? God is the author. What earthly man was he using to write the book of Revelation for us? John. John was a disciple of Jesus. Walked with Jesus. Uh, we've seen John much older in, uh, in life. He must be somewhere around late 80s, maybe early 90s at the time that he's writing this. So keep that in mind. All the other uh, disciples, the apostles who walked with Jesus, all of them have been executed. John's last remaining one. Where is he writing at the time that he's writing this? He is in the island of Patmos where he is a prisoner for proclaiming the truth of God's word and the testimony of who Jesus was. So keep that in mind. And it is one of the few books that God inspired, written through man, that actually has its own holy outline. If you look in chapter 1, verse 19, we have that outline. So find the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 19. And it says, Jesus' words, there should be a red letter edition as John is writing what Jesus said. He says, write the things which you have what? Seen. The things you have seen. That's chapter 1. Then it says, not only write the things that you have seen, but also the things which what? Which are, that's talking about the church age, the age in which we live in. And we get that chapter um, 2 and 3 where it's talking about the, the loveless church, the persecuted church, the compromising church, the corrupt church, the dead church. And then we get over here to the faithful church and followed by the lukewarm church. All of those are churches that existed at the time that John was writing this. Uh, matter of fact, he may have been the overseer of these seven churches. So how heartbreaking it would be for John to hear from Jesus that you got a compromising church over here. you got a corrupt church over here. And if he's the leader over the pastors, how he has to go back and, and rebuke them and say, Look, guys, you have to change the direction in which you're going. Now, I also have made the statement that I believe that it applies. One of these seven churches applies to every church in existence today. Every church will fall into one of these seven positions. They are one of them. Now, we say, what is a compromising church? Compromising church is the one who says, well, you know what? The Bible needs some help in interpreting it. You know, uh, one of the biggest things right now, it, it has split churches, it has split denominations, is the, the one about the gay and lesbian homosexual agenda, the LGBT, and they want to make sure they have opportunity to be leaders in churches. And you have some churches, like the Baptist churches, specifically the Southern Baptist churches, that's ungodly and it will not be tolerated. But then you have other denominations that have split. That tells us right there that they compromise. The ones that have said, hey, not only is it not a sin, they can actually be leaders in churches. They become corrupt. Wow. 
Sad day we live in, but there are compromising churches, there are corrupt churches living amongst us today, and in other countries, there's persecuted churches. There are very few that I believe are faithful. What makes up a faithful church? Faithful believers. Because you are the body of the church. We are, as believers, the body of the church. We make up the church. Now, you can have a faithful church that has some people that have compromised, that are corrupt, but... We need to remain faithful to God in all things. So here John is writing, and he's writing about the church that lost its love, the church that's become persecuted, the church that's uh, compromised and corrupt, dead. The sad thing about the dead ones is they live in the past. They talk about what they used to do instead of what they're doing. <laughs> they don't have a, a projection of what they're going to do. It's, it's heartbreaking. Thankfully, Chambersburg Baptist Church, we are not either, any of those. I believe that we are found as the faithful one doing what God's called us to do. What has he called us to do? There's two things God has told us, instructed us as individuals, as well as a church that we are required to do. What are those two things? Love, love, love. love Him. Love Him. How do we demonstrate we love Him? By obedience. How do we demonstrate we love Him in obedience? By sacrifice. Giving up some of our time like you've done today to be here, to tune in. Giving up our, our, our finances to, to go into missions or go into a, the church to sustain the work that God's doing. Whatever it is, there are things that you have to make sacrifice for. Some give up like this one of the worship team, talent. To come into practice and get things ready. Some because they can run soundboards and video projections. They, they, they give up their time to make the PowerPoint. They give up their time. See, that's sacrifices of time and energy that they could be doing somehow. But they're giving it to the Lord and the Lord will bless them. So then we get this outline. Again, it says, write the things which you have seen. Write the things which are. And write the things which what? Will happen. Will take place after this. What is the Greek word for that? Metatoktos. And we get that word found in the very first word in chapter 4. So we know it's indicating that that's beginning in chapter 4. And chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way to the end is the things that are happening after this. So we get in chapter 4. John representing the church. The, uh, the word says, come up here. And so John is caught up off the earth representing the church. The church will be caught up off the earth during the time we call, what's the fancy word? It, it, the rapture of the church. Now, if you don't believe the rapture happens till pre-trip, you can be okay with that. If you don't believe the rapture happens till post-trip, that's okay. When we're going up into the sky, I will make a note to tell you what's happening. Because we will be caught up into the heavens. John is getting to see what we will get to see. And it only makes sense when you study scripture in its totality that for seven years, what's going to go on down here on this earth? Tribulation period for seven years. Well, what's going to happen to the church in the heavenlies? We're going to have judgment. But then we're going to have rewards. I believe in the first half of the tribulation period, God is going to be bringing judgment upon those things that we did not do, that we should have done. People we should have shared him with that we chose not to because we were embarrassed. Uh, or the things that we did that we didn't ask forgiveness for and we should have. We'll give an account for that. But then halfway through the tribulation period, which is three and a half years, I believe that's when we'll start receiving our blessings. We'll be getting that crown of life. We'll get the jewels in those crowns. We will get crowns for other things we did for the Lord. Those things we've done in Kauai, he will reward openly. Praise the Lord. It's time to rejoice. Now, we get to uh, chapter 5, and we saw that there's a, a one on the throne. What, he ha what does he have in his hand? He has a scroll, and John sees the scroll. And we know that it most likely represents what? The title deed to this earth. In the title deed to the earth, what does that mean? God created the earth, and he put man in it. When he created the earth, he has a title to the earth. He gave that up to man and said, take care of the earth. Uh, we'll have to pay for what we have done and not taking care of the earth. But anyway, we'll have, uh, but then what did man do? He in turn forfeited to Satan, gave it to him by giving in to sin. Well, we get chapter five where the one on, uh, on the throne has the scroll and a mighty angel calls out a loud voice. Who is worthy to do what? And take the scroll and open it by breaking the seals. How many seals does it have? Seven. And John begins to weep because no one was found in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. And then the mighty angel drew John's attention. Said, hey, wait a minute, buddy. Look, look over here. And what did the angel point out to John? Who did he say was there? The lion. That's very key. The lion from the tribe of Judah. We know that to be Jesus. When John turned and looked, who did he see? He saw the lamb sacrificed, slain before the foundation of the world. He saw the, the, the blood, the stains. He saw the nail prints. He saw the Jesus he knew. Wow. But he rejected.
rejoiced because he is worthy. And then we saw as we got into the breaking of the seals, those were judgments that were put upon the earth. We see the Antichrist rising to the scene. Now, something has to happen right before the Antichrist becomes the leader, ones that it, one is, that is revered by others. Now, at the time, he's already politically making his move. People respect him. People are, are caught in by his charisma. They, they like him. He's a very likable guy. Russia is going to join forces with others, and they're going to invade Israel, and all of a sudden, boom, God's going to intervene, and like a miracle, they're going to disappear. Antichrist is going to take Privilege of that. He goes, I did that, you know. He's going to take the, the glory for that. And the man who would rather believe the lie than the truth is going to buy into it. He's going to start establishing the one world government. He's going to have a ten nation federation brought together that he is going to be the leader. They're going to respect him. They're going to trust him. And in the process of that, he's going to also have a, a person called the, well, let's get to it. We got uh, the next few chapters talk about the different uh, judgments. And then we get to the seventh seal. And what happens when the seventh seal is broken? The trumpet judgments begin. In the trumpet judgments, we see the different things taking place on the earth. To, and, and remember, when we say God's judgment is falling upon the earth, it's not just to punish them. It's to get their attention to say, I am God. I am sovereign. I created you. In my image, you were made. I want you to worship me. I am a jealous God. And so men have the opportunity to worship him. How are they going to hear about him? Well, everyone you've shared your faith with is going to resound in their mind that are lost, that are here during the tribulation period. They're going to remember the things you've done, things you've made notes in. If you make notes in your Bible, they're liable to come over to your place. And when they find out you ain't there, they go into your place, they get your Bible, they start reading through and start stuff and start making more sense to them. We have groups of people in different denominations that write stories of what is happening when all of the believers are no longer on the earth. And it's for passing down to family and friends that need to know the truth, that aren't hearing the truth. That the ears would be opened. Well, we start seeing that. We have how many thousand evangelists walking the earth during the tribulation period? 144,000 devoted men of Jew, uh, uh, Jewish men who are only focused in on getting the truth of God out. They're not worried about their life. They're not worried about the government. They're not worried about a religious system. They're only worried about getting the truth of the gospel out of who Jesus is and what he's done and what to expect for all eternity. Now, not only do we have the 144,000 uh, men that are on the scene, who else do we have? We have these two witnesses that are different than anybody else. One of them we're pretty sure is going to be who? Elijah. Elijah's going to come in there and, 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 and these two men are going to have the power that if the governmental leaders come up against them, if the community people come up against them, they have the power from their mouth, whether it's blowing out their mouth like fire, like a dragon, or just calling down fire brimstones from heaven to destroy the people, but they will be able to destroy those who get in their way, not believing the truth. Those who would never accept Jesus, those who would never turn their heart over to God will be judged at that time through these two men. But what's going to happen to them? Halfway through the tribulation period, what's going to happen to them? They're going to die. Guess who's going to get the glory for it? <coughs> yeah, the Antichrist. He's going to get the glory for it. He's taking them people out. See, these people have made things uh, life miserable. They bring judgment. And, 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 and they're talking about the immorality. And they're talking about the different things that people are doing that they want to embrace and love. And here, these two men are condemning it. And they're such a nuisance that there's a news crew following them. When they get executed and they're dead, their news crews are going to be on them. How long are they going to be dead for? Three and a half days. And all the world will see them rise from the dead. And just like the word rapture that we saw John in chapter 4, we also see again for them two men. And what does he, God say? He says, come up here. And they are seen by the whole world going up into the heaven. What's going to happen? We're in the heavenlies. What's going to happen? We're going to rejoice. We're going we're to be song breaking out. It's going to be a party. <laughs> And all the earth dwellers are going to be shocked. Some of them are going to understand the truth of who God is. Some of them are going to revere God. Some of them will probably turn their heart over to God. But then there are those that won't. That's in chapter 11. We saw two witnesses. Then in chapter 12, we get a little indicator of who the... the, the, the it talks about this woman. This woman in chapter 12 represents Israel. Israel gives birth to the child who is Jesus. And Jesus is the one who come to forgive us of our sins, to pay our price that we couldn't pay, lay his life down as, a, as an offering for us, but then to take it up again to show us he had power and authority over death itself. 
Then we hear about the dragon, and we know that to be Satan. We talk about uh, his political leadership is going to be based in the, the, the seven hills, which is known as what? Rome. He will establish the political headquarters there in Rome, and uh, it will be the area where he will sit and, and, and lead the people. But then we see uh, chapter 13 tells us about this, this Antichrist. He's the beast from the sea. And it talks a little bit about him. And in the halfway through the tribulation period, we, we see scripture in chapter 12 tell us that Satan, who is using the Antichrist, he decides when he starts seeing most likely into the heavenlies that we're receiving rewards and he is the accuser of the brother. He is furious. He's upset. So what does he do? He takes all of his demons and they attack the heavenlies. And God gave authority to Michael the archangel. It says that Michael the archangel fought with Satan and his demons. And Michael not only prevailed, but also restricted access to the heavenlies by Satan forever. Satan furious. He knows his time is even shorter. He comes down on earth while he was gone attacking in the heavenlies where we're at receiving our rewards. What happened to the Antichrist? <laughs> he was killed. You know, I, I really wonder what Satan's going to think when he goes back and says, what in the world? I just left you for a few moments, you know. And, and so what does he do? He entered that body of the Antichrist and he raises it up so that he can use that body. Some believe that the, the Antichrist is completely dead and his soul goes to perdition. Others believe that he was mostly dead. <laughs> I don't really know what mostly dead and, and, and all the way dead really means. I mean, I, I watched The Princess Bride, one of my favorite shows in the whole world. I love that show. It's just an amazing show. And, you know, it, it, there's one scene in there where the main character is, well, he's mostly dead. He's not really dead. He can't really move around as good, but he's mostly dead. Well, the Antichrist, we know from Scripture, he's going to be blind in one eye. He's going to have a withered hand on one. Uh, he's going to have issues of that assassination. So Satan embodying him has now got to live within the limitations of what that body can do. So he's may have been mostly dead or all the way dead, whatever it was, he looks and appears that he has risen from the dead and all of the world who cast stones at Jesus are going to marvel at this man. See, because man would rather believe the lie than the truth. The lie feels good, tastes good, looks good. The truth is convicting, condemning. Wow. So here you've got uh, chapter 13. Not only do we see the Antichrist, but we also find out that there's a one world religious system. A false prophet is on the scene. What does the false prophet do? He has gathered together all of the world religions. Remember, all the believers are gone. We're gone. Out of every organization, we're gone. Guaranteed, there are some who are not believers that are in different denominations, that are in different religious groups, and they're going to be saying, hey, what has happened? They're going to believe that lie of the Antichrist. They're going to see the false prophet. The false prophet's going to have the right words. Everybody's going to come together, and they're going to have unity for the first time since the Tower of Babel. It's going to be impressive because what can man do when they're united? They can do quite a bit. Well, we see that this one world government led by the Antichrist, one world religious system led by the false prophet. There's going to be a one world currency. And then there's going to be this thing called the mark of the beast. Without the mark of the beast, you cannot buy or sell. You cannot do any commercial. You cannot live. So therefore, those who are understanding the mark of the beast condemns you forever, they're not going to accept the mark of the beast. And they're going to live a very difficult, challenging life. Remember, during some of those judgments, the sun is going to get really, really bright. And it's going to burn people who get out. Then it's going to go really dark. It's going to be really cold. It, they're going to have to scavenge. And it's going to be difficult for them. That's why I tell people, it's better to give your heart up to Jesus now than wait for the tribulation period. It's going to be a time of difficulty. That's why it's called tribulation. Nobody in their right mind wants to endure tribulations in their own life. We get upset. When we have to go through different tribulations, when things don't go our way, when we get to go through different trials. I mean, just something as simple as having a flat tire can make us lose our faith. Friend dying with cancer that shouldn't die, make it hurt. See, we live in a system that is led by the enemy. He hates us. Why? Because God loves us. And he hates God. Why? Because he wants to be God. He is filled with pride and arrogance. He thinks his way is better than God's way. Wow. Jesus made things simple for us. Man wants to complicate things. Well, then we get to um, last week. We, well, then at, at the end of the seventh trumpet judgment, what begins to happen? There are some bold judgments. And the bold judgments are one we talked about, about them low them swords. We talked about the, the sun getting bright and getting uh, dark. And then we get to uh, chapter 17, and we talked a couple weeks now for the scarlet woman. Anybody remember what the scarlet woman represents? The scarlet harlot represents religious 
Babylon. That's the one world religious system. And, and it's funny because the system in which they use is being used today, not only by the Roman Catholic Church, but other organizations that model themselves after the Roman Catholic Church. And we saw not only about the Scarlet Woman, but the Scarlet Beast. We saw that this religious system led by the false prophet is the one with real power because it said that the Antichrist and his kings couldn't do anything without the permission because she sits on the people, controls the people. Now, we know that whoever controls information controls people. And, and, and I don't want you to be shocked, but that's being played out today, especially with our political arena, especially with the coronavirus. Whoever controls information controls people. We know that. It's an established fact. No big deal. We understand that. It's truth. It's absolute truth. We can reject it all we want, but it's still true. There's only one way to get to heaven. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through who? Jesus, Jesus through his death and resurrection. It's the ABC of salvation. What does that mean? What is A? Yes. Admit that we're a sinner. The Bible says we're sinners condemned to unclean. However, by the grace of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, died on the cross and rose again. And then you have to do what? See? Confess with your mouth that you believe in your heart. God made it as simple as one, two, three. ABC. He wanted us to know. He, he's not trying to hide himself from us. He's trying to reveal himself to us. He's revealed himself through his word that he has preserved. He has revealed himself through the testimony of other believers. He has revealed himself in creation itself. We see God's handiwork all around. He wants us to understand. He wants us to know truth. You are the smartest people in the chamber of the surrounding area. You understand that you want truth. I believe that most people are watching because they're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. They want to know. And God has allowed us to understand as time has gotten closer to the end time, he has allowed us to understand more. Now, last week we talked about the, the, um, the Scarlet Harlot. We talked about her uh, leadership. We talked about how the kings of the earth were going to hate her. And then finally, they're going to destroy her. And God puts it in them to destroy him, destroy her, which is the religious system. Why? Because God has never embraced, never loved religion. He wants relationship, not a religion. He don't want people to do X, Y, and Z just because they think that it honors God. He wants them to love him. He wants them to know him. You cannot know God. You cannot really love him unless you make time for him. I don't know anybody in a dating relationship that says, you know, I'll see you once a week for about 30, 40 minutes. That, that, that'd be good enough. Yeah, we can get married. I don't know. Yeah, a couple. No. What do we want? We want to spend all the time we can with that person because we care enough to get to know them to see if that's who we want to spend eternity with, forever with. That's what God says for us. He's already chosen us. He wants to spend eternity with us. He's already paid our debt to make sure we can have eternity with us. But it's our choice. He's chosen us. Have you chosen him? He's wanting you to choose him. He's made it as simple as he can. He's proven to you who he is. There's some scriptures that I didn't get a chance to read last week. I want to read in light of what we studied last week about the uh, Scarlet Heart of the religious system. In 1 John chapter 2, I'm going to just read these out and you can go back and look it up. We've got it recorded so you can see it. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. What does that mean? If you think in your mind, if Jesus says right now, come up here. Will you weep? Will you cry? Will you mourn? Because you love the things of this earth and the things that you get to do. With. I love motorcycle riding. There is nothing more that I love more than motorcycle riding. I will throw the motorcycle away in order to be in his presence. See, you can't love the things of this world more than him. Because if you do, he's not truly Lord of your life. So, he says, do not love the world or things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that love the world. What is that? Number one, the lust of the flesh. Number two, the lust of the eye. Number three, the pride of life. If you give in to these things, not the Father, but it, you are of the world. And the world is passing away. The lust thereof and those who... Do not uh, who, And who does the will of the Father will abide forever. 1 Timothy 6, verse 21 and 20 says, O oh, Timothy... Now, remember, this is Paul writing, God writing through Paul to a young pastor of a church. He's trying to give him some insight. He says, oh, Timothy, guard what it was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. 
Isn't that what a lot of people go after? They seek knowledge. They want knowledge. Remember, knowledge is not wisdom. Knowledge is different from wisdom. Wisdom is having the knowledge and, and then living rightly because of that knowledge to influence other people. Here, it says, by professing to be filled with this knowledge, some have gone astray from the faith. Knowledge and the seeking of knowledge will take you away from the seeking of the Lord. What does God say to do? We are to spend time studying his word, applying his word to our heart, living our life out for him. And if we're seeking worldly knowledge and we're not studying the word of God to get godly knowledge, we will be filled with the world, and the world is filled with a religious system, <laughs> a political system. And then we'll think that we know more than God and that the Bible and those who believe it are ridiculously dumb. I have people that are very well educated that believe that. They believe Christians are the most ignorant people on the planet. They don't accuse anyone in any other religion. It's just Christianity. Why? Because there's something powerful about the name of Jesus and it brings conviction even through your life and your testimony. So we get Isaiah in chapter 1. It says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be as wool. Remember the scarlet harlot, she's riding the scarlet beast. Scarlet represents our sin. That beast is filled with sin. It was destroyed not only from causing us to bleed out and die, but if we every time we give into sin, it, it, it gives him more power and authority in our life. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good. This sounds like America today, folks. Not only America, but other places in the world. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. To live a godly life is now looked upon as living one filled with homophobia, idiotcy. It's, it's one that we are um, thinking ourselves are, are filled with pride. And we are called haters of people. Why? Because we don't condone sin. Because we don't embrace sin. Because we don't exalt sin. I'm sure there will be some people very offended by the message today. They probably were offended in religious circles last week. They're going to be offended in other circles this week. Am I concerned about that? Are you concerned about that? Let me tell you, if you're concerned about offending people who embrace sin and love sin, you need to question your salvation. Because you cannot endorse what we know is wrong. If you endorse what we know is wrong, you should have been okay with Charlie Manson being released from prison. You know what he said? He said in the deaths of these people that he did not personally kill, but he had killed... He said that I was only doing what was in my nature. Wow. If we're only doing what's in our nature and it should be embraced, then all of those mass murderers should be set free. Because they were only doing what was naturally coming to them, what they desired to do. But notice that we have boundaries. We can say it's okay to live an alternative lifestyle, but we cannot commit murder. Now they're trying to say that uh, having sexual relationships with a child is, should be okay because it's in their nature. No. See, they're calling good evil, and they're saying what's evil is good. We're going to continue to see that on a rapid pace in America because that's the direction we're, we're going. Why? Because Jesus is about to tell, call, he's, the Father speaks to tell his son, go get your bride. And we, the church, will be called up into the heavenlies. We will not have to go through what's going to take place on this earth through the tribulation period. But the people on the earth, the earth dwellers who have rejected your message, have rejected God's message, has rejected everything they've seen of God, they will be held accountable. So those judgments are to try to get their attention one last time. Because see, when we talk about an eternity forever and ever and ever, it's serious business. Isaiah chapter 29 says, Therefore the Lord says, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths, oh, and honor me with their lips. Oh, they were, I am removed from their heart. And then God speaking through Paul says to 2 Timothy, saying it says to Timothy, it, it's having a form of godliness but denying its power. Of such people, stay away from them. Stay away from them. These are religious people. God says stay away from religious people. You're involved in a relationship. Love God. Love others. Love them. Reflect him. In the church, religion is not. It's saying be in the church, but not of the religion church. We want to be the bride. 
False religion is the worst enemy that God has, and it is, is all over the place. Babylon, this morning, chapter 18. Look at the first couple of verses with me, and then we're going to talk about it. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray right now that you block out distractions as we've looked at the book of Revelation up to the point of uh, chapter 18. Help us to understand what your word says. Help us to be able to apply it to our life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 18, verse 1 says, After these things, there's that word again, I saw another who? Angel. Folks, tune in and listen here today. I want you to understand something. When we die, we go. the Bible says to be absent in the body, be present with the Lord. We do not convert to angels. Do not put on Facebook that heaven's gained another angel because we're not. Do not demote me. Do not denote, demote yourself. The Bible says that Jesus was made lower than angels. We are considered lower to the angels, but we will be over the angels. The Bible will tell us in a couple weeks, we will judge the angels. We don't become angels. We are men and women. We have a choice to choose to worship God. And when we choose that, we are a child of God, the bride of Christ. We're not to be demoted to angels. Angels are servants of the Lord. Do not think that. And I know the world says it. Don't believe it. The Bible does not say it. We will not become angels. This is a mighty angel. What is an angel? It's a created being in the order which God created for his service. We get the opportunity to choose to serve him or not. We are going to be greater than the angels. Not right, not right now. We're created in the lower order from angels, but we will be greater than the angels. That's why we will be able to judge the angels. That's a lot of power to be able to judge people. We will be able to judge angels. Wow. That means it will be a little bit lower in us when we are married to the groom as the bride. The Bible shows many times that angels watch us and are amazed. We don't see God. We don't see his glory. We don't get to hear him, and yet we choose him. It brings marvel to them. Wow. They take notes when preachers preach. They take notes when Christians witness. They take notes because they don't have the opportunity to do that. So chapter 18, it says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having what? Great authority. And the earth was illuminated by what? His glory. Why is his glory illuminating the earth? Because he's been in the presence of God. Just like Moses when he was in the presence of God, came down from the mountain, he illuminated everyone around him, and they were fearful. We, when we're in a relation with God, and we spend time on that mountain, we spend time in his presence, when we come down, we should be radiating the love for him. You know, you can always tell teenagers when they get a new boyfriend or girlfriend, oh, they come in, they beam, and they smile, and oh, they, everything's going great. Working with youth for 18 years. I can always tell when teenagers came in and they got a new boyfriend or girlfriend. They don't cloud nine, man. Everything's going great. The world is in order. You know, two days later, they've broken up, and they're all down in the dumps and sad, and it's crazy. You know, the emotional up and down, up and down, up and down. You know, oftentimes I, I heard an older person tell me this in, in, in ministry one time, that I would, I would calm down, I would settle down, I would slow down, I, I, I would get it. Everything would be okay, and I, I, I'd become just like everyone else. I said, oh, Lord, I hope not. But anyway, uh, I, I would think often, you'll get over that. Talking to young people, you know, new boyfriend, new girl, oh, you'll get over it, you know. If it does, then that's not the right person. If we get over our relationship with God, then we have to ask ourselves, were we really in a relationship with God? Because see, he loves us. He brags on us. He talks about us. You know, we have that illustration in Job. God tells Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? Because see, Job was doing everything right. Job was being blessed by God. And God said to Satan, have you noticed it? I wonder if God has spoken to Satan about you. About me? Is he saying, hey, have you noticed my servant? Or are we just a byproduct in the back, background somewhere? I guarantee he's asked Satan if he noticed Billy Graham. I bet many a time. Praise the Lord, we have at least one great evangelist who lived out his life under all the convictions he had without wavering. You don't see that too many. You see a lot of falling from grace, giving in to simple temptation. And, and, and it's the Lord because it looks good, tastes good, feels good. <laughs> Here, this angel in the presence of God comes out. His glory radiates everywhere. Look at chapter 18, verse 2. It says, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is what? Fallen, is fallen, has come, uh, and, and has become a dwelling place for who? Demons, a, a prison for every what? Foul spirit, a cage for every what? 
unclean and hated bird, which represents evil and wickedness. In other words, Babylon has become the prison. Well, wait a minute. Didn't we just say last week in chapter 17, Babylon has fallen and the kings have destroyed Babylon? Oh, remember, that's Babylon, the religious system, the one world religion. This is Babylon, the commercial center of the world. We're talking about where economics makes a big difference. Buying, selling, and trade is very important. This is the key place. This is where all the money is going to. Remember, it's one world government, one world religious system, one world economy. And this is the center of it all. You say Babylon, not Rome. Well, remember, Babylon existed first. Rome was on down the line. And we make references to Rome because it's still there. Oh, wow. Where's Babylon? Oh, if you know your geography, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Matter of fact, I made notes of it, so I wouldn't forget because I didn't, I didn't know exactly where it was. Anybody know exactly where it is? Um, well, 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 we're going to get to that. A city. Some people are asking, is Babylon going to be a real city? I believe it's going to be a real city that's going to be rebuilt. And people are going to call it Babylon because of its importance. Now, remember, the political power is in Rome, and then the economic power will be in Babylon. There's a reason for that. Now, how can that be? Because if you know Scripture in Isaiah, why I really want to be preaching Sunday night through Isaiah because of what it says in chapter 13, verse 19 through 22. It says, Babylon, the most glorious of kingdoms, the flower of the Chaldean pride, will be devastated like Sodom and Gomorrah when God destroys them. Now, let me, Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember the story about Sodom and Gomorrah? God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, rescued Lot, turned the whole entire city. To, and, and, well, you know what? If you wanted to take me on a trip, you could not take me to go look at the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know why? We don't know where it's at. Most people believe that it's at the bottom of the Dead Sea. <laughs> and I've been in the Dead Sea, and you can't really go down very far. <laughs> Um, I don't want to go there anyway. You're not taking me to the bottom of the Red Sea. I mean, Dead Sea. <laughs> I, I, I want to stay above the sea. I want to be able to breathe. I don't even want to go down over the oxygen tanks. I want to stay away from it, the, going to the bottom of the Dead Sea. So you can't go and see. So I'm going to destroy my God the face of the earth like God declared it. But here he's declaring about Babylon. It's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Isaiah 13 verse 20 says, Babylon will never be inhabited again. It will remain empty for generation after generation. Nomads will refuse to camp there, and shepherds will not bed down their sheep there. Desert animals will move in into the ruined city, and the houses will be haunted by howling creatures. Owls will live among the ruins, and the wild goats will be there to dance. Hyenas will howl in its fortresses, and jackals will make dens in the luxurious palaces. Babylon's days are numbered, and its time of destruction will be soon. Well, you know, if you want to take me on a tour of Babylon, guess what? You can take me on a tour of Babylon. See, it's still there. Some of you, I don't know if you remember this, back in 19... Actually, it's today, October 11th, 1990. Go back in time. What was going on? Well, we had this one crazy president. Under presidents... This is out of the New York Times article. You can look it up under New York Times, October 11th, 1990. Just type in uh, New York Times, 1990, um, Babylon. Under President Saddam Hussein, I mean, no, Saddam Hussein, one of the ancient world's most legendary cities, Babylon, has begun to rise again. More than an archaeological venture, the new Babylon is self-consciously dedicated to the idea that Nebuchadnezzar has a successor in Mr. Hussein, whose military prowess and vision will restore the Iraqis' The glory of their ancestors, the, the, it was known of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Kuwait, and Israel that was all under Babylonian control. Iraq, uh, the Iraqi people are not Arabs. A lot of people think that they're, they're not Arabs. They are Persians. And they all consider the area that included um, not only Iraq, but Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Kuwait, and Israel to be theirs. They own it. They're the Babylonians that desire to control it. It is one of the only cities that conquered Israel. So wow. Saddam Hussein claims himself to be a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Saddam Hussein built not only the palace of Nebuchadnezzar back, but he put his own palace not too far away. Now I want you to think about the Gulf War that took place. You know, under General Schwarzenkopf, we had the opportunity to destroy Saddam. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Saddam Hussein. We had an opportunity to kill him, take him out. But you know, at the beginning of the war, it was declared 
that we were not to destroy anything in Babylon because of the archaeological digs going on in the history that was there. And guess what? Apparently that Hussein guy found out about it because he went to his palace. He stayed there, so we could not get him. Isn't that crazy? Now, you know, I know you're thinking just like I'm thinking. Oh, I was in the army that time. I'm thinking, why don't we just send a group of Navy, Navy SEALs in there and take him out? Because we don't know who's going to be the leader afterwards. You might know who's crazy now, but you don't know who's crazier later. So, you know, it's always keep your enemy close so you know who they are. But anyway, so he has rebuilt a lot of Babylon already. It is a place you can go and tour. So the prophecy of Isaiah has not come to fulfillment yet. Therefore, during the tribulation period, Babylon will be restored. It will be the economic place, and it will be a place that will be destroyed. When? I'm glad you said it. Look back at chapter 18 now. Chapter 18, it talks about Babylon. It's falling. It's falling. This place is going to become a holding place, a prison for these demons and everything else. Look what it says now in uh, verse 3. For all the nations, that's the whole world, have become drunk with what? Her wine of her wrath of fornication. In other words, they've all made these uh, adulterous relationships with her because they want what she has. The kings of the earth, they have committed fornication with her. And all of the merchants of the sea of the earth have become rich in abundance of her luxury. And I heard, John saying, I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her. Okay, now some of you some, see some people believe that come out of here is uh, the rapture of the church at the end of the tribulation period. That's not the same exact word as this rapture that we get with chapter 4 where John is spoken of, chapter 12 where the um, 144,000 were spoken of. Here it's a little bit different, but really what it's saying is God's word, because it's his voice, saying, Be careful, tribulation saints, be careful. Remember, 144,000 to two witnesses. Lots of people getting saved. His, his tribulation saints are on this earth. He's saying, be careful. Come out of her. Don't get, enjoy the sin that she is promoting. So it says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sin. And lest you receive her plagues, for her sins have reached to the heavens. God has remembered her iniquity, rendered to her just as she rendered to you. In other words, vengeance is my saying the Lord. He's saying, here's the vengeance being. I will repay her Double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix a double for her. Wow. In the measure that she has glorified herself and lived luxurious, in the same measure, give her what? Torment and sorrow. Why? Because she says in her heart, I will sit as what? See, she don't need a king. She is supreme. <laughs> she, she, she doesn't rely on anybody else. She's got it all. She said, I am the queen. <laughs> Not only does she say that she is queen, and this is Cash is king, you know, you've heard that. This is really saying Cash is not king, it's queen. Because one world economic system under this leadership will say that it is queen of all. And I am no widow. Mm -mm. Don't, even, don't even talk about the man who's died who thought he was king. No, Cash ain't king. Uh, whatever we're using, cryptocurrency, whatever it is, the queen is leader. And not only that, but she will say, also say what? I see, I, I do not see what? I do not see sorrow. Will there be sorrow? Yeah, but she's not going to be focused on it. Why? Because it's all about the currency. It's all about the money. It's all about the pride and arrogance. Come with being wealthy. Here it goes. In verse 8. Therefore, her plagues will come in what? What? One day. We're going to find out that it's quicker than just one day. But in one day, this will take place. Death and mourning and famine. Oh, my. And she will utterly be burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges the kings of the earth. Going back to kings who committed a fornication have lived luxuriously. How? With her. Because they wind and die in the currency situation. They made money off of people. Uh, the people through whatever taxation they may have at the time. And, but they will weep for her when they see that it's being destroyed. Uh, you know, sort of like when the stock market, I mean, you know, when 9-11 took place, that infamous day we'll never forget, and the stock market crashed and it went down. People lost lots and lots of money. They were going to weep and, and, and howl and, and be disappointed and sad because they've lost a lot of their investment. That's what these kings, they're losing their investment because it's crashing down. It's not going to be of any value. So it says that they, they, they weep because of what is going on. They lament for her. When they see the smoke of her burning, standing where? <laughs> at a distance. They ain't going to help her. They're standing at a distance. They're far off. But why? Because of the fear of her torment. What does that mean? <laughs> Let's get to it. 
they're going to be saying, alas, alas, the great city of Babylon, the mighty city, for in what? One hour. One hour your judgment has come. Sounds a little bit like a nuclear bomb goes off because no one's going to go near her. We know in this day and time, Don's day, he didn't understand. He didn't understand a bomb that could drop and blow out a whole entire city, take out thousands and thousands of square miles and, and people. He didn't understand that. But he's seeing the kings, they're standing off at a distance looking, saying, oh, we're not going to raid. Uh, and they weep and, 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 and lament because now their fortune is gone as it's smoking and burning in one hour it is destroyed and then in verse 11 it talks about the merchants of the earth they will weep and mourn over her as well for no one buys their merchandise anymore do you see the self-centered tone they weep and howl for, them, howl for themselves because now their fortune is not worth much no one's going to buy because they don't have the economic system in place any longer it's destroyed well it gets worse look at what it says it's going to list all this precious um, material stuff. Look what it says. No one's going to buy the merchants of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen of purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of wood uh, or citron wood, uh, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon and incense and the fragrant oil that actually is literally myrrh and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and ho uh, sheep, horses and chariots. And bodies and the souls of men. That's talking about slave trade. By the way, you know, we think we live in a day where slave trade is not going to exist. <laughs> it's always existed. It will always exist even to the end of the time. During the tribulation period, there will be slaves taking place during this time. What kind of skin will they have? What will they look like? Who knows, but it's probably just going to be poor. Poor people. Because poor people always end up serving a master. So anyway, uh, uh, here it is. Maybe people have gambling debts or whatever debt they have that they can't pay. They become slaves. In verse 14, it says... The fruit that her soul longed for has gone from you. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you. And you shall find them how often? No more. The merchants of these things who become rich by her will do what? There is stand at a distance for fear of her torment. Especially if it was a nuclear bomb. They don't want to get close to it. We know what radiation can do to you. Weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, the great city that has was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. That sounds almost like the religious harlot, the scarlet harlot, the religious system that was covered, cut, clothed like that. In verse 17. For in what? One hour. Such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by ship, sailors, and as many of the trade on the sea stood at a distance, there it is again, and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what is like this great city? They threw dust where? Oh, this is a sign of grief, of, of sorrow. They, they threw dust on their head and they cried out, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city which all who had ship on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in what? One hour, One hour she is made desolate. Well, isn't this amazing that here the kings who hated the religious Babylon destroyed it? And yet God is going to destroy the economic system. In verse 20, it says, Rejoice over her, O heavens, and uh, you holy apostles. One of the few places that we see the word apostles mentioned there. And prophets. For God has done what? God has avenged you on her. In contrast to self-centered uh, mourning of those who have lost things, material things, of opportunity. Here it's talking to the martyrs. Saying, you gave your life for what you believed in. You are being rewarded by their judgment. And then the final section we're going to look at, verse 21 says, Then that mighty angel, a mighty angel, remember we talked about the angel? A mighty angel, that means he's powerful. He took up what? A stone, a millstone, something like this, except huge, a great millstone. Now, it is estimated it weighs over thousands of pounds. So this mighty angel, he's pretty buff, he's pretty tough, he's strong, he's probably big on one hand, I don't know. But whatever it is, it makes an impact upon John, who knows the weight of a, a millstone. He says that he picked up this great millstone and he threw it into the sea. What happens when you throw a rock into a sea, into an ocean, into a pond? It makes you know bigger the rock, what? The bigger the splash. You throw a big rock in there, it has this ripple effect, and it's kind of cool. 
Can you imagine a great big thousand pound rock falling into the ocean? What it would do? I think it might be some kind of waves coming from that. But anyway, it's going to have a shocking effect. It's going to make a sound. You know, it makes a do do. It has this deep voice of a rock hitting a, a, a deep uh, pond. It makes a cool sound. If you've not seen that before, you need to go on down to the to the, one of the ponds down there with a rock and throw it up and watch it hit. Listen to the sound it makes. Um, here it says, he took that great mountain and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence. A great city of Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found. In other words, utterly destroyed anymore. What happens when it's destroyed? The sound of the harpists, the musicians, the flutists, and the trumpets, you know, the ones that are throwing the party, having the party partying all the time, it shall not be heard anymore. So now not only is it going to be violent, it's going to be silent. No craftsman or anybody of any craft will be found anymore. And the sound of the millstone uh, shall be heard in uh, you uh, anymore. And the light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. What does that mean? Not only is it going to be violent, it's going to become silent, it's going to be permanent, and there's going to be no more people witnessing or sharing Jesus with anybody else. The time for evangelism is over. <laughs> We're at the end of the tribulation period. It is all coming to fruition. Judgment is being poured out. Look at the last part. After you're not going to hear the bridegroom or the bride, for your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery or magic art, all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and of all who were slain on the earth. In other words, if Babylon here is referring to all of that which goes against God, uh, both from the saints of the Old Testament to the New Testament to the tribulation saints and prophets, God is finally going to demonstrate to them, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay wicked. He is going to be victorious over all. He has given them seven years of challenging issues to turn their heart to him. It's his last attempt to get their heart to know truth, get their mind to focus on him, and to turn their life over. But guess what? It's not too late for us. It's not too late for those listening. Whether it's during the church age or whether it's during the tribulation period, we always have access to God's throne by admitting we're sinners, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, came to this earth, walked a perfect life. He lived, laid his life down on the cross and took it up again. If we believe that, the Bible declares it, the testimony of the church who is not there during the tribulation period will be a testimony as well. All you have to do is confess with your mouth what you really believe in your heart. But you got to believe it. Because, folks, going to church is not going to make you a believer. Going to church is supposed to encourage you that you're not alone. Going to church is not something that should be dreaded. Going to church is not something you wake up and say, oh, it's another Sunday and i got to go waste another hour or two going to church. No, we are the church. You should be excited when Sunday's coming around because you get to mingle with other church members saying, hey, you're not in it alone. We're in it together. You understand who God is in your life. Understand the temptations the child's are going to come. Understand that others need your assistance in praying for them. Understanding the importance of fellowship. Understanding that you are not alone. You were bought with a price and he's got a plan for your life. Never discount that. I got a friend of mine. Uh, matter of fact, Steve does it. We met through Romeo Riders. Uh, Rodney, he, he got to meet him. Son was a, living a rebellious lifestyle. He was also a motorcycle rider. Ended up getting saved, praise the Lord. And then dying in a motorcycle wreck not too long after. In his death, his wife got saved. Praise the Lord for that. They were party animals. So for her to get saved and, her, and, and Rodney's grandchild to be raised up, praise the Lord. But Rodney's son's best friend, James, James lived that same lifestyle. James had it, had it tough. If I said his last name, many of you would know him. He was a party animal for a while. He ended up giving his life to Jesus. I spoke at a Men of Promise, a Promise Men's Rally here, and I got to meet him and hang out with him, talk with him. A believer loves the Lord, understands that God rescued him because he was going down the path of destruction. September, I think it was September 17th, he decided to end his life. Before he ended his life, he heard God speak to him. He said, James, what brings you happiness? 
his response is telling people about you. Now, he, he had been in a, in, a, in a place of desperation, depression, discouraged, separated from his wife, lost custody of his daughter, heartbroken. Then he heard God say, what else brings you happiness besides sharing me? My favorite answer, he said, riding my motorcycle. And just as plain as day, he heard God speak to him saying, get on your bike and go share me. Well, that sounds fun, right? It sounds all, all right. He said he had to quit his job where he has money coming in for his livelihood. Pack everything up on a, on a motorcycle and then take off. He had a friend in Maine, I think it was Maine or Vermont, one of those places up north saying, hey, you come up here, I'll let you share your testimony. Take up a collection for it. So right now, I want you to pray for James. James is traveling by motorcycle to any place that will open the door to share his story. A sinner condemned unclean, partying up, giving his heart to Jesus, even as a believer, wanting to end his life. See, the enemy screams loud. Folks, the church has got to be there. We have to be there for members that are hurting. We have to be there to encourage them. We have to be there to let them know they're not alone. And encourage them that God's got a plan for their life. So we're going to pray for James. James is traveling from the north. Anywhere that opens the door up. So we're going to pray for God to open doors where God's testimony from this devoted man can be spoken so that others out there that are in the midst of desperation, discouraged, and depressed can understand that Christians can get in that, but that God can rescue them out of it. He didn't go to a psychiatrist. He didn't go get drugs. He went to God, and God has spoken into his life and given him a new seal for living. And I think it's because God wanted him to proclaim the truth of the gospel, and it wasn't getting through to him until this point. If you're watching or you're here, and you've never given your heart to Jesus, he's asking you today. He's saying, I love you. I've done everything I can to show my love for you. I have a plan for your life. You're chosen. You're perfectly made in my image. I created you. But you have to turn your life over to him. Saying, Lord, especially many of us can say, I've made a wreck of my life. It's gone down the drain. Can you help me? And guess what? He won't take you from the consequences of sin, most likely, but he will help you go through the trials and tribulations you will have because of that. And you know what? You'll have joy from your salvation. You'll have a peace that you never had, and you'll be able to share the testimony with others. So what will you do with Jesus today? Let's pray. Father, we pray if you speak to anyone that is listening through Facebook, uh, uh, through our website, anybody here today. Anybody that has never invited you to their heart, Father, I pray that you would speak into your life and say, I love you. I pray that they hear your voice, Father. I pray that they understand that you've got a plan for their life. They have purpose. They have meaning. And, Father, those that are discouraged and depressed, where the waves of this world are crashing in on them and they cannot see the light, help them to understand you are there with them. Father, I pray that those that don't know you would turn their life over to you. Those that do would surrender every part of their life to you. Maybe that happiness that they're seeking can't find is because they're not doing what it is you've called them to do. Father, I pray that they would understand your voice. Hear your voice and go after your voice. Going after you. Father, I pray that you encourage the rest of us that are here. We want to pray right now in a joint effort for James. We pray first for his safety as he travels. We pray for him to be able to have doors open to him. That he would have the words to say, Lord, that you use him as a vessel like none before. And Father, we pray a, a guy that's not been to seminary, not been trained, not, not a, a speaker designed to speak in front of thousands of people. Father, we pray you open doors so he'll have the opportunity to speak into the lives of thousands of people because he's experienced it. Help him be an encouragement to others. Father, help him to know you have bought him with a price. And you've got a plan and purpose you want to live out in his life. The stories he'll be able to share, the testimonies he'll be able to give. Father, we pray that it will reach those that need to hear it. We thank you for the relationship I have with him. And the commitment that I've made to pray for him every day. That you will get the glory and honor. Father, as a church at Chambersburg Baptist Church, help us to pray for him. 
And Father, we pray that you'll be with those that are here and be with those that are listening as we go throughout this rest of the week as we've given the first fruit of our week to you in this worship service this morning. We pray that you bless us, that you would bound to give us bounty more than we ever imagined, that you would help us to be able to have opportunities to share you, that you would open doors for us, Father, and give us the courage to walk through them, whatever it may be, that we can love you and love others and we can demonstrate that love not by condoning or embracing sin, but standing firm on your word and the love you have for every person. We give you praise, honor, and glory this morning. For we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you being here this morning. Those that have listened.